All right. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you know all the Kengis and participants who are joining us for the session on ethical concerns in research on urbanization, AgriCope webinar. Um, we I think we have around forty participants already, so we can just start. Uh, my name is Anwar Pradhan. I'm a member of the Cope Council. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Neha Sami, Associate Dean at the School of Environment and Sustainability, and Senior Lead of Academics and Research at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements for this lecture. The lecture, as you can see, is called Ethical Concerns in Research on Urbanization, Perspectives from the Global South. Um, I've already introduced Neha. Neha is a faculty and at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, and her research focuses on the governance of infrastructure, especially mega infrastructure in the context of post liberalization urban India. Um, the presentation today is going to be about questions of questions of ethics, which is which are integral to the process of doing research. Um, agendas around ethical research should be talked of in context of space, space, place, and political economies, among other considerations, and must be part of every aspect of doing research, from funding to publication. In this talk, Neha is going to offer reflections and perspectives on thinking about research ethics from the global south rather than for the global south, focusing specifically on urban research. And without more ado, I'd like to hand over to Neha. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, it is really a privilege to be uh, here and I'm delighted to be uh, speaking to uh, all of you and just sharing um, reflections um, from, not just my own reflections from a couple of decades of doing work uh, in Southern, context in Southern urban uh, research, but also drawing on kind of reflections and um, experiences that my colleagues, uh, both at IHS and elsewhere, have had as researchers located within a Southern context and uh, focusing specifically on questions of urban research. Um, so, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, I will be drawing not only on my own experiences, but also on collective research and reflections from uh, colleagues across um, IHS. Um, I was asked to focus particularly uh, at the start on, on uh, ethics in publishing more specifically, but um, I felt that it was, uh, given our experiences, it was difficult to uh, think about ethics in research in isolation um, you know, in in, in an, uh, the ethics of publication in isolation, rather than thinking of it in in relation to particular components of the the larger system overall. Um, and this is partly because uh, it, it draws again from experiences that we have had uh, at IHS. And I should say at the outset that um, research ecosystems in Southern context are not equally mature. Um, in sort of the Indian context, for example, there is very limited, uh, a very limited set of resources and funding available to do uh, research. And as such, um, you know, whatever research is done uh, tends to be highly dependent on um, both partnerships and funding that originate from outside the country. And while we've been extremely fortunate at IHS to have uh, many long-standing partnerships and have had um, <clears throat> the experience to be part of global research projects, uh, there are kind of reflections that we've seen from uh, from this and from, from our experience as well as experience of other colleagues uh, that I think uh, inform what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, and, and I think to start out with, I'd just like to sort of uh, mention that despite the fact that while we've had the fortune of working with individuals and institutions that have been deeply sympathetic and empathetic to uh, the context within which we work, the overall terrain of knowledge production and dissemination remains deeply skewed in favor of northern modes of research and production, which then tends to cascade down to outputs uh, and systems of um, knowledge production and dissemination themselves, which are which reinforce and are reinforced by uh, existing grant making frames. And this is partly why I want to talk about thinking about, about both ethical as well as equitable approaches to doing research that uh, and that that sort of cascade across the larger ecosystem uh, and the process than focusing only on the question of publication. Um, so I'll focus on four key aspects today. The first is the framing of the process itself and how to build a shared research agenda. The second is the research funding process. 
Um, the third is how we think about co-producing research. And the fourth, uh, and each of these will then lead to the idea of how we disseminate um, our research. Uh, so to start out with, like I mentioned earlier, um, the, the question of doing research at a place like IHS um, works and operates across two layers. First is the, is the idea of actually building equitable partnerships across the North and the South, bringing into uh, question sort of relationships with Northern partners who have to operate within very particular frames and, um, you know, are, are sort of compelled in some senses to uh, to valorize certain frameworks that emerge and as well as outputs. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's absolutely critical for us to think about um, research partnerships that we develop that are equitable uh, and that don't think of research, which is increasingly being located, particularly in the urban context, um, in, in, southern con in southern countries and southern cities, uh, especially given that most of um, the, the sort of fastest and most rapid change in urbanization you see is located in the South. Uh, and so as research continues to uh, build emphasis on sort of inter international partnerships on working in Southern contexts, um, it, it has become very important for us, both as a Southern institution uh, that, that, you know, works on these kinds of questions that we do not um, kind of work in partnerships that are not framed as equitable from the very beginning, because this then cascades into the modes of research, the way the research information and data is used, uh, and the ways in which um, it translates outwards. The second is that we emphasize collaborative research, not just uh, across sort of the North and the South. So, so not, not just to think about it in terms of the way in which research is done and the, the actual process of perhaps collecting primary data, but also the ways in which the research agenda is framed from, from the get-go, like from writing the proposal onwards. And so uh, we think it is, we have, and we've been fortunate enough to be able to work with partners who see uh, this and, and, and recognize this and have, you know, been able to sort of work with us as equal partners. Uh, this, however, doesn't always work um, and, and, and is important often for us to step away uh, from partnerships that don't, um, don't enable this. Um, partly because this then cascades to the second point, which is the question of sharing agency. Uh, and in IHS, we need to think a little bit also about partnerships that work ethically and equitably, not just with our partners, whether domestically or overseas, but also with communities within which we do these research, um, these research projects, whether they are, um, you know, sort of gov within government, across the private sector, or uh, across sort of a range of marginalized and uh, dispossessed and, um, you know, in some ways, uh, not equally represented uh, communities within, uh, within cities as well. Um, the third thing that I would like to emphasize within kind of this idea of building a shared research agenda is to think of ways of expanding opportunities for participation. And I, by that, I don't mean participation just in the research process, but also in actually framing the proposal and framing the questions itself. Very often, uh, these are not you know, these these are not broad based. These do not involve particularly communities in which this research is going to be done. And this again, like I mentioned earlier, is really a concern um, for urban research, given the urgency of questions being studied and the fact that impact of these research projects will be felt very directly uh, in communities on the ground and has uh, impact for sort of translation into policy and practice. And in the absence of building a collaborative, equitable, shared research agenda, it will not actually be possible for us to arrive at truly equitable global solutions, which we need in, in, in the, the, the kind of research that we do. The second, uh, and no less important perhaps, is the, the idea of research funding itself. And we need to pay attention closely to how research grants are framed and what frameworks uh, they, they tend to valorize. Um, like I mentioned earlier, in the absence of uh, robust ecosystems and institutional support networks within Southern context, we remain dependent hugely on research grants that come from uh, <clears throat> outside uh, the, the Indian research ecosystem. And changing these is critical to opening up knowledge production systems because uh, with very few exceptions, uh, funding calls are often kind of, uh, they have built within them 
overall approaches in terms of the kinds of theory that that should be used or can be uh, applied um, methods that need to be used, particularly when they come from particular disciplinary perspectives and the kinds of outputs. Uh, and 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 this begins to kind of speak to the question of how we think about uh, equitable and ethical dissemination of the research that we do. For example, uh, you know, um, in in uh, there are several sort of uh, grants from the ESRC in the UK that ISS has been part of that require broad-based international partnerships across a range of stakeholders with specifying impact on the ground, but on the other hand, uh, expenditure is limited through budget caps, and so. You know, there's very often a 20 to 30 percent gap on how much can be spent on actually building these partnerships and, and involving stakeholders. And in the absence of being able to broad based participation in the process of research itself, it's very difficult to then, um, you know, think of how we can have outputs that are then, you know, that that are representative of the kind of work and, and the kind of situation that we're studying and the kind of problems that we're studying on the ground. Um, ground constraints, therefore, um, limit in some senses meaningful partnerships both across institutions um, as well as kind of lead often to the development of re research ecosystems that serve very particular needs and outputs and are kind of valorized um, in the kinds of frameworks that 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 are set at the beginning within these research grants. The third is the question of co-producing research. Uh, and this again operates at two levels for a, for a place like IHS. The first is to think about you know how we can learn and build with partners. And so there are many things that we have learned as an institution at IHS um, with working with colleagues across multiple disciplines, uh, particularly when we've worked with co other colleagues across the global south. Um, it has been extremely kind of meaningful for us to develop a shared research question agenda uh, that that also allows us to share knowledge, learning, and experiences across different contexts. However, there has there have been sort of unfortunately fewer instances where we've been actually been able to co-produce uh, the, the research question agendas alongside communities uh, in which we are doing this research. Uh, and this is, is, is uh, unfortunate because particularly in the context of urban research as another kind that we do that focuses on urban transformation, uh, it becomes really important to develop shared outcomes, which are kind of useful beyond just uh, knowledge creation uh, alone, which, which can translate into teaching and learning materials, which can translate into uh, materials that potentially communities can use for activism, they can use for um, evidence-based decision-making uh, across a broad set of, of networks of stakeholders um, and, and it, it, in the absence of being able to co-produce this research along with communities and sort of respondents of and, and, and sort of you know um, audiences who are involved as respondents in the research itself it becomes difficult to to think about developing shared outcomes that have uh, wider use and wider dissemination. Um, this becomes even more important in the context of North-South partnerships, particularly because uh, there are hidden layers and and uh, sort of social identity markers and power dynamics at play um, in both contexts and across these contexts uh, that 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 kind of impact and influence the ways in which um, research can be uh, co-produced and then sort of creates this, this, this sort of dynamic between researchers and respondents, but also within different sets of respondents. And so uh, being able to bring people together to be able to kind of develop uh, a sort of broad-based approach to thinking about research questions and research agendas is absolutely critical to then be able to create outcomes and outputs that are uh, you know, useful and, and have sort of wider use and dissemination beyond just uh, sort of developing academic outputs. And this actually brings me to the question of actually disseminating research. Um, when we talk about publishing, um, very often we tend to think about publishing um, on you know, very particular kinds of platforms. So internationally recognized journals, typically often you know, published in English. Um, and, and, and also uh, this automatically privileges a certain set uh, and a certain kind of research community. Um, 
to illustrate, you know, the, the, there has been a lot of research, for example, that we have done at IHS, along with labor unions in multiple states in India. Uh, a lot of these are the, the members of these unions and often leaders of these unions are not necessarily literate. If they do happen to be literate, it's not necessarily that they're, they're literate in English, uh, but they have immense sort of uh, depth of, of experience, which is critical to the, the research project itself and to be able to do, uh, you know, the, and produce the kind of outcomes and insights that we have been able to produce. Um, it is therefore very important for us to represent uh, the, the range of, of, of sort of experiences, the range of, um, of, of kind of respondents and to have them be represented in their own voice rather than be translated through uh, the voices of academics or a faculty uh, or researchers. Uh, and so one of the key things uh, is to be able to write collectively. Um, and one example from the, the, the work that some of my colleagues did with labor unions was that uh, in addition to actually involving them in framing the research question and agenda to kind of make sure that the outputs of that research project were something that they could use in furthering their claims uh, was also um, uh, the, sorry. I don't know what happened here. One second. Uh, was also the the um, the fact that they we were able to collectively write uh, outputs uh, in Hindi, uh, which is what they were most comfortable in writing with, and publish them uh, through platforms um, that were available uh, to us here in India. Uh, however, not all of these or these kinds of outputs are necessarily valorized or uh, accepted within you know sort of research grants more broadly. That brings me to the second kind of second question. What kinds of outputs do we think about? Uh, and again, academic writing, academic papers are absolutely critical and essential to spread the kind of, you know, to make sure that, that knowledge is, is disseminated, it's spread, there is sort of broad-based sharing and understanding and, and the building of a research community. Um, however, valorizing only those kinds of outputs and those kinds of, uh, of, of sort of publications uh, limits the, the the use of that research itself, and and in some ways um, is not quite fair to the community in which because they are it on on which this research was sort of carried out in some senses because they often do not have access to that research. Uh, even if we were to share the research outputs with them for their comments and feedback, if they're often published in English, it depends on us. Uh, translating that for, you know, uh, a lot of communities. And this is true, not just of, you know, communities like labor unions that I spoke of, but often also government officers who in, in sort of small towns and villages where they work with and in the local language and may not actually uh, be comfortable with frames of research that are being used uh, in, in the kinds of outputs that are produced through academic frames. Um, the third part of this is for whom uh, is this research actually being produced? And, and I think that it, it is really important to be mindful of different audiences. Yes, there's absolutely the need to, to be accountable to research funders, to a larger research community, and to be able to disseminate that, uh, you know, for access to these communities. But it is also equally important for researchers to be responsible to the communities within which they do research, the communities of practice with which they work, uh, and to be able to feed that research back to them. Uh, and very often, the kinds of academic publishing uh, or the kinds of outputs that are valorized by uh, research grants don't always include um, you know, include sort of a broad range of, of outputs. Uh, and like I said earlier, we've been fortunate enough to be able to work in, in grants and projects that have allowed us to do this. And so, for example, uh, you know, a recently concluded project that we did with colleagues at the Development Planning Unit at UCL, uh, the NO project allowed us to work extensively with uh, housing rights activists and then create material, uh, teaching and learning materials from our research um, that were actually visual and non-verbal. And so the question of sort of literacy uh, and um, sort of language was, 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 you know, was moot at that point because we were able to bypass that by creating uh, materials that were uh, visual uh, and, and were able to kind of be used across multiple sites, multiple communities, irrespective of what uh, language uh, and form they were most comfortable with.
The fourth question is, this, this is again similar, which is where and through what kinds of platforms do we disseminate this research? Um, and, you know, again, very often while, you know, uh, the, the sort of conventional printed journal article uh, remains the gold standard for research publication, um, it's been very heartening to see both academic journals as well as a whole range of other platforms open up. Uh, which allows, you know, the publishing of works in progress, which allows the publishing of sort of gray literature uh, and, and also increasingly allows the, us the ability to, uh, to publish, you know, in multiple languages. And I think particularly in a place like India that is so, sort of so diverse in terms of uh, the kinds of, uh, of, of access to knowledge and the kinds of uh, literacy and, and, and sort of language diversity, uh, this becomes a really, really critical question for us. Uh, and and, and it, this ties back in some ways to the question of, you know, framing research agendas and research grants, because the ability to translate, for example, is really expensive. And if there, are, if there isn't the, the sort of funding resource available within the research grant, it is very rare that research institutions or universities in you know, places like India have the resources to be able to translate that into even one or two Indian languages, let alone uh, sort of a larger kind of set. And so thinking about, you know, where this, this research is disseminated and where and how it's being published is absolutely critical um, to the kinds of research that we do and, and to be able to feed that back and close the loop with communities with which we have done research. Um, the fifth thing in in the sort of this in 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 this list that I would like to focus on is the question of open access, and there has been sort of a a, a push towards open access more and more uh, over the last sort of decade or so. And while this has been really heartening to see, and it's been sort of good to see sort of research open up and move away from sort of being behind paywalls, uh, the question of the cost of, of, of this is, is uh, to me, a deeply ethical question um, because it circulates uh, and, and it, it sort of has, has a built-in assumption that universities or research grants have the ability to pay for open access. And uh, in, depending on the journal that you're applying to, depending on the publishing house, uh, um, the, the, the fees for open access are anywhere from sort of you know 150 uh, US dollars all the way to several thousands, uh, and this becomes a, a, a deeply challenging question because uh, for one, you know, it is very rare that universities in India or research institutions have a separate budget, uh, unlike sort of universities um, in sort of northern or western context that are de that has a dedicated fund for you know publishing uh, open access research. It is also very often, um, you know, sort of charges and, and sort of journal fees are prohibitively expensive uh, for for libraries and librarians uh, in, in Southern context. Um, and so this question of open access, while, you know, it moves towards in some ways democratizing and opening up research also kind of limits it by having these kinds of barriers to entry, which make it unaffordable and inaccessible for the researchers themselves who published uh, and whose work it is, uh, for other researchers within India. And so, you know, it becomes really difficult, for example, for other academics in other Indian universities to access these if they happen to be behind paywalls or uh, if their institution has not been able to pay for, uh, for journal access or if my institution as the sort of publishing researcher has not been able to pay for open access. Um, and finally, it is these are absolutely then out of reach uh, for sort of communities uh, and, and stakeholders who have been part of the research process as respondents and on whom this research was conducted. And finally, I want to close with this, this idea and this question of sort of language and literacy. And that is an absolutely critical one because a lot of research, and I've heard this from colleagues across other uh, Southern contexts as well, is a lot of research is, is published uh, and in, in largely uh, English language uh, journals. And this becomes a, a, a challenge both for, for people uh, and researchers based in the South for whom English is not their primary language, um, but for whom, you know, it, it becomes critically important for, for both their own career adv advancement to publish in highly ranked international journals, uh, but also, you know, these are frames that are set within research grants where certain types of, uh, you know, journals and uh, kinds of outputs are valorized. Uh, and, and this makes it kind of challenging for, um, 
researchers for whom English is not a primary language to be able to publish. Uh, and, and there is very little support that is offered both within institutions here, uh, as well as institution, as well as within sort of, you know, publishers and, and journals uh, to be able to actually enable, uh, you know, researchers to be able to write. And I'm, you know, at this point, I'm talking about researchers who are reasonably sort of established and senior. Uh, this is particularly a challenge when it comes to kind of building research capacity and for junior researchers who are just beginning their, um, their, their careers. Uh, and the, the final part of this is, is this question of literacy and, you know, a lot of work that we do, for example, at IHS um, in sort of urban context is with folks, uh, with communities and participants who are not necessarily literate and definitely not as comfortable in English. Uh, and so to us, it becomes a deeply ethical question of how do we feed back some of this research? How do we feed back some of this, this knowledge? And, and how do we make this constantly available? to the communities with which we are working and uh, and and uh, you know make sure that they are able to use and and sort of close that loop of of being able to do research and so i'd like to kind of close by saying that research outputs are tied not only to um, geographies of flows um, not only to how sort of knowledge is is produced and how it circulates, but also to who enables that circulation and uh, the modalities through which such circulation takes place. Um, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions, comments. Thank you very much, Neha. This was a fascinating talk and uh, I think there's a lot for all of us here to learn from it. Um, not just for us at code, but also the attendees. I really like how you spoke about, uh, you know, research has to be equitable, it has to have a partnership, it has to be collaborative, and that there must be agency for all the stakeholders which are involved in the research ecosystem, like, uh, which includes often participants from the ground, from the field who are not. So, I mean, we often talk about the question of English and the difficulties in publishing English, but there is obviously the question of literacy about how when you do research in, I mean, not just in cities, but, you know, research, uh, any kind of field research or any kind of qualitative research which involves respondents, there will be a question of literacy and how to represent that. Um, we already have a couple of questions. Perhaps I'll just read out the questions, Geha, and, uh, you know, we can go one by one. So we have a question uh, by Zoe Mullen. Um, that other than waivers and discounts for lower resource researchers, do you have any other suggestions for how we can make open access journals more accessible for authors? Um, I, I think part of it is, um, you know, I think what ha what used to work really well, the environment and urbanization, for example, it used to have a really nice model where um, they, they had an agreement with Sage where they actually used to send printed copies of journals to a set of libraries across the world, um, which I think was really useful because, uh, you know, not a lot of um, universities across India um, actually have access digitally to a lot of these things and so i think while there is definitely sort of the the environmental cost of printing and and sending um there might be ways we can think about of actually making these available locally um there are also i think um ways of 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 actually i think broad basing some of the 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 ways in which this this research is not necessarily just through sort of journal articles but perhaps also through shorter formats through publishing uh, you know in different um registers it's not necessarily just the 8 to 10000 word journal article but also enabling uh different formats which you know could be shared um through panels like this so so you know even if the 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 resource or the research paper itself cannot be made available uh you know openly uh, and i understand that might not always be possible there are other ways of being able to share that research uh and you know if if, if kind of journals were to and and there are journals that are doing this uh you know to, to frequently do panels um there are you know um uh, journals that actually post uh sessions across uh different sort of you know, geographies, uh, you know, they do panels that are locally that, you know, embedded within regions. Um, so there might be other ways of disseminating research, which are not necessarily focused only on disseminating the published word, but actually sharing the knowledge much more broadly. Um, I think it's also, uh, you know, there are more and more people who are actually publishing preprints, which I think is great. 
uh, you know, it makes that that research available before it goes into uh, sort of uh, the, the journal system itself. And a lot of journals uh, don't actually have restrictions on those. I think the other, honestly, the, the other way to think about it is to think about more journals that are based in the South. Uh, and I think that this is a really hard fight, uh, mainly because it takes very, very, there are already very well established journals. Um, these have, you know, sort of very high metrics. Uh, they're, they're journals that, you know, are, are immensely kind of sought after in terms of, you know, individual career advancement. And I think that it's, it's critical to be able to think of moving the center of dissemination to context where actually research is being done. So, so to be able to find ways of developing, um, you know, ways of disseminating work in, you know, say India, for example, or, but, but those are, that, 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 you know, for example, the EPW, the Economic Political Weekly has been doing this in India for a very, very long time, which publishes absolutely fantastic research, but it's often consumed only by Indian researchers or researchers who are interested in, you know, sort of Indian questions. Um, so to be able to find ways in which we can perhaps, you know, broaden that, make that more relevant uh, and, and sort of not have it, you know, be limited in some ways to um, just the context within which they're written, I think would be to me a really useful way of starting to think about it. Thank you, Mia. Um, we have a question, uh, we have a comment, comment and question by Lee Harvey. On open access, it is ridiculous that journals charge so much, but more to the point, why don't universities group together and publish subject-specific research of their own online and bypass rip of journals altogether? I think IHS, <laughs> like you can talk more about what IHS is doing. So, uh, yes, um, I mean, I, I really wish more universities could come together and publish this. Uh, and like I said, a lot of this is also embedded within kind of research grant frames and you know there are often requirements of the kinds of outputs that are uh you know mandatory in some senses that are required um you have to publish certain kinds of academic outputs but um i think some of the things that ihs has done is that we actually have on our website um the knowledge gateway uh and and we actually put out a lot of our work uh open access free of cost uh, in the form of white papers, in term, in, in the form of policy briefs, in the, in the form of teaching and learning materials, um, and and we make that widely available, um, you know, just on our website as much as possible. Uh, and this is mainly, you know, uh, and this is not to say we don't publish academically or we don't publish in journals, but we do absolutely, uh, you know, try and put out as much of, of our work as possible um, freely, uh, open access only because that's really the only way in which we think we can provide um, you know, and change or start changing this sort of terrain of urban knowledge, uh, you know, production and dissemination. The other thing that we have tried to do over the last five to six years is that we have actually, you know, together with Sage set up uh, a journal called Urbanization, which publishes particularly sort of research from the South that focuses and encourages uh, junior researchers to publish, which encourages practitioners to publish. Uh, and we have sections in there that may not necessarily be recognized as academic um, publication, but, you know, we have interviews with practitioners. We ask people to reflect from uh, pedagogy and teaching experiences that we've had. And we also provide through the word lab which is our sort of editorial support team at ihs uh, an extensive amount of support to um researchers for whom english might not be their primary language uh, and so it, it is an immense amount of load on the editorial team at the journal but it is something that we have sort of taken on uh, and we try to do um consistently with each issue so to, so as to be able to provide a platform really for people to be able to publish more widely uh and, and across different formats thank you Mia. i will add that uh, i mean a lot of these problems also stem from the university or you know as, as neha also mentioned in the lecture from the career progression point of view and how a lot of universities and education institutions are only prioritizing publications of a certain kind, which they are then being made to prioritize by the funding agencies bringing national governments due to sort of chase the rankings and so on and so forth. So which makes it difficult for um, a lot of that collaborative research to happen. Um, but anyway, I think there's another question uh, by an anonymous attendee. Um, do you think transformational agreements could be a way forward to help researchers to access content behind paywall? Uh, 
I'm not myself entirely sure what transformational agreements are, but in case Neha, you know. I'm not entirely sure either, but but I do know that there are, um, and I don't know if this is what they meant, but these the, I do know that there are several institutions across the South who've actually entered into agreements with uh, with publishers to waive uh, open access fees or have or or you know as institutions come up with sort of reduced open access fees, um, you know, for um, those researchers accessing it from within their journal um, or within their university and within their institution. So, for example, uh, you know, the University of Cape Town has an agreement with, uh, with Wiley Blackwell that allows researchers and faculty within the University of Cape Town to be able to, uh, you know, benefit from open access for specific journal articles and for specific journals um, because of an agreement that UCD has with, with them. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I Again, th this, these are not completely, um, you know, inexpensive. Uh, there is there is definitely a cost, uh, and and I feel like while that's part of the way forward, I really don't think that that it's the only way forward. I mean, honestly, it, it is just appalling the amount of money that is being charged for, like you know, article processing fees at Sage, for example, often go to up to three thousand dollars, which is just unbelievable. Um, and, and even if we ha we did have the money to do that, how do you decide which articles get to, you know, sort of be part of that process and which don't? Um, you know, it, it, it becomes a, like there, there are sort of questions and, and, you know, sort of particularly around sort of making it equitable and ethical at every step of the way as far as dissemination of research goes. And I think that um, the only way really is to sort of start bypassing a lot of these these publishing houses. but it's not always possible, like we were saying, because it's it's sort of it's what grants are predicated on. Uh, it's what you know, and and if you if you're not able to do that, you're not able to get the next research grant. You're not able to get a promotion. Uh, and and this is not just in. I mean, even I'm not talking only about sort of northern or western context. Even the Indian government has put out a list of sort of reputed international journals, um, in which you know, faculty at public universities need to publish if they want to advance in their careers, and that becomes. Um, immediately a bottleneck because you know their students can't read it, their colleagues can't read it, um, and so I don't know that there's any one solution only. But I think that there just needs to be a conversation around sort of transforming the the sort of process overall. Uh, and and until universities start kind of thinking about different ways of rewarding and different systems of incentives that go beyond just sort of publication in you know highly ranked academic journals, I don't think this is going to change very quickly because there are, you know, there are just cogs at every step of the way that that valorize and, and reinforce some of these practices. Thank you. I think they, they might be meriting also, I mean, we have a comment, but after that, you know, in, if we have time to perhaps also reflect on what publishing houses can also do about this, because I'm sure a lot of the people here are from publishing houses. Um, so, you know, what can they do to make it sort of more accessible? But we have a comment uh, from Tori Sinaj that journals with paywalls should be avoided altogether. We have entered an open access era and that we should all find journals that have open access and have waiver policies. Yes, absolutely. I agree. But uh, it's not always possible because, you know, not all journals, it, there are, depending on the discipline that you come from and the field that you are in, that's not always an option. I agree. I mean, conventionally, technically speaking, I'm an English professor, and I think most of the journals that we have for English in India don't even have, aren't even in that list of the journals which are by the university, and those which are, are not open access journals. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Um, we have any other questions or comments? I think uh, while people are thinking about questions, you know, if you'd like to talk a little about what perhaps publishing houses can do, and then you spoke about how you know there's some people have ag agreements with publishing houses like Sage, and for example, how IHS also came together with Sage to set up its own journal. So what GAC can mean for you know research in the global south and how GAC can facilitate more access and equitability for researchers in the global south? Sure. I mean, I, I think that, that uh, there are several journals. Um, and I'll speak from sort of 
urban research particularly because that's what I'm most familiar with. But there are several journals that are doing, uh, you know, a whole range of different things. So one thing that I mentioned is different formats. So many journals are, are you know, they're, they're publishing, they call it different things, but short sort of 1500 to 3000 word pieces uh, as collective. So, you know, IJA calls them interventions. I think uh, there are other journals that call them debates, uh, you know, and so they're not necessarily fully fleshed out academic pieces, but they are reflections on, uh, you know, ongoing research. Uh, and they often have agreements that make those completely open access without, you know, sort of being behind a paywall. Um, there are also, um, I think, uh, the, the work that we did, I mean, in the urbanization that IHS publishes with SAGE, uh, I think was was set up very specifically with uh, one, the agenda or the aim of being able to uh, publish reflective writing, whether from practice or from research. And so we end up having practitioners, you know, from within government, for example, or, uh, you know, from community based organizations across the world uh, who write. Uh, and publish within within the journal. Um, we also encourage different forms of of output. So you know, in in uh, in the past, we've had everything from photo essays to art exhibitions being being showcased uh, within the journal. And so it, you know, it's also a, a way of sort of thinking up and opening up what counts as a valid output. Uh, and and that is not just the written word. And and in a lot of these, we have we've seen sort of uh, you know colleagues from uh, and, and sort of participants in the research process who are not necessarily literate in English uh, be able to write uh, and be able to sort of have their voices heard through through art, through poetry, for example, uh, which which you know has been kind of which has been easier for us to to translate in some ways from you know Indian or other languages just because of you know the length of these things. The other um, and I think that we we don't kind of talk about this enough is really just. The cost of translation and uh you know it would be amazing if we could actually particularly and, and this is something that i didn't talk about but you know particularly now with sort of ai and chat gpt i mean there's there's all kinds of other kind of ethical issues around publishing and dissemination of work that we're beginning to see uh and it's not an easy question to resolve but one thing that that could potentially help us with is translation uh and and to be able to sort of make that more widely available um the 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 question of you know sort of uh, and this is something that I didn't talk about because we ourselves are kind of working through it and thinking through sort of the ethical dimensions of uh, you know students for example or researchers using um, various AI based tools uh, to think through and and to to enable them to sort of you know improve their sort of English for example if for an English language journal or uh, to be able to present their their research in a, in a format that's more are uh, you know acceptable or palatable um and and there are sort of you know absolutely kind of questions about plagiarism that are involved over there but there are also questions about uh kind of how do we provide support to so many people who need the kind of editorial support that they need uh which is just not possible at this point physically and financially thank you Neha. i think on this uh, issue of open access there's another question which is like, what are the open access journals available in the global south and how can we bring them into the discussion about disseminating research worldwide? I do understand that there are ways to make effective collaborations in academic publishing between the north and the south, but I think that academic and scientific publishers can learn from the champions and researchers based there. I, I, I guess by their experience, global south. So. Oh, uh, unfortunately, the, the examples are sort of few and far between. And um, what has often happened is sort of larger publishers have often gone after these models uh, in the South and, you know, sort of through lawsuits, etc., force them to either change them or shut them down or make them sort of much more closed. Um, but there have been uh, and, and there are instances of um, <clears throat> folks who uh, who set up here in India uh, a set of academic researchers who set up uh, a press uh, which was uh, voluntary and it was on a sort of voluntary pay model uh, and so you know researchers would pay um, what they were able to to cover costs of publication mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and, and and I think the 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 model there was that as long as it covered expenses and you know they would limit what what it did was it limited the amount they could publish 
uh, and the volume that they could process. But it did mean that whatever they published was open access and freely available because some um, researchers were able to pay slightly more, some were able to pay slightly less. Uh, and that kind of balanced out in some ways, subsidizing each other as a research community, uh, as and when there, were fund there was funding available. Um, the other uh, uh, ways in which um, folks have is to, it, I mean, sort of journals within and, and publishing houses within the South have tried to work through it, is to make things open access for a limited period of time. Uh, and so, you know, to make it open access for three months or six months or a year, uh, at which point they sort of, you know, really mobilize and, you know, sort of push it out to multiple networks. Uh, and then it goes behind a paywall. So there's there's been that as well. There's also, of course, I mean, been ways in which um, there are very, very discounted uh, rates um, for, you know, for journals that are, that are published here. We also, uh, you know, particularly in India, we're fortunate because it remains relatively inexpensive to print. Uh, if you don't, you know, don't for a minute think about the environmental cost, because there's also, I think we discovered over the pandemic that this idea of everybody being sort of on the internet is not really true. Uh, and we found a lot of people who um, actually didn't have the kind of digital infrastructure that we assumed everyone had, uh, which kind of, you know, led to shortfall in learning outcomes and things like that. But uh, given that um, the ways in which sort of a lot of uh, uh, journals here uh, have been trying to do it is to you know not charge for or, or print fairly cheaply uh, and that automatically reduces the cost of production and to be able to send it out so one model might be and I, and I know that there are book publishers who do this where you print particularly for India right you print in India and you disseminate it here so where you know the cost of production are then reduced significantly um, so I mean, th there are ways in which folks can be uh, and have been trying to be creative. You know, like one of the things that we do at IHS, for example, is that we put a larger body of work out there and then kind of, you know, pull out smaller pieces from there that we then send out for publication. But uh, because there's also the, the kind of ethical question of not sending to journals what we've already published before. Uh, and so we put them out, for example, often as research reports. And so the main findings often get uh, get shared and translated, um, but not often, uh, you know, the, the other way is actually to think about more forms of popular writing, you know, to write as op-eds, to write as blogs, to write, um, because I think it's also a question of saying, what is the what is the purpose of the dissemination? Do you want to get, get you know, get it out in terms of just circulating that knowledge uh, and then share it more widely? Um, because the purpose of publishing in a journal is also to share it with a very specific set of audiences. Thank you. Yeah, I think yeah. I mean, like I I can also add to that and say that uh, in in my discipline also, I mean, not just literature but largely South Asian studies, there are very few. I can't think of any open access journal. Um, many of them have discounted rates. Like uh, my own journal, the one on Jose Ricardo Team, I am also books out some articles as open access, as you were saying, but it is not open access per se. So yeah, I think that's, that's true. And, and that, yes, thinking uh, is also a challenge that, for example, again, at my journal, um, uh, the publisher has been kind of constantly pushing us to not think anything at all. Like, they would rather that it was online. And, you know, we constantly keep saying, no, we want some print copies. So it's a constant engagement. Yeah, it is. But I mean, I think the thing is, it, it's really, you know, good to see and hear people think about this, people talk about this. And I think really, eventually, the pushback will only come from researchers and research communities. Um, there has to be kind of, if we as a collective stop valorizing some of these frameworks and some of these, you know, sort of processes, eventually, you know, like, something will have to give. Thank you. I had another question why I think I can at least think of something else to ask, um, which was about, I, I like your point about the like right? and about how um, there is an engaging question of representation, which we were also discussing in the previous session. But in terms of how, how would you gain, how, for example, if you could talk about how that works out. So, you know, if you're doing work with somebody who's not entirely different or who is not different at all, and then you wish to like collaboratively with them. So how does that work out? Um, I think that in, 
one is again uh, to write collectively and collaborative collaboratively to what end so you know in the example that i mentioned a couple of the examples that i mentioned there were very particular needs that the communities that we were working with had and they didn't particularly care about necessarily you know being published in academic journals but they did care that their names were on reports that went out uh, and so you know we were able to um, write and publish reports in hindi uh, that that went out that circulated to uh, audiences and communities that they were concerned about sort of sharing their work with and this is also because you know we sat together and, and developed sort of the research agenda and research questions together with uh, these these labor unions I mean colleagues of mine and I just did this work and um, you know there have been ways in which uh, you know we've been trying to think more about the ways about how to uh, you know in addition to meeting demands and requirements of sort of research publishing uh, how can we produce other outputs uh, that that are actually uh, of use to the communities in which we work and the housing rights um, you know research that i mentioned earlier was another example where um actually a lot of this was uh, produced by um you know learners in the urban fellows program as well uh, who were actually able to um to, to think about ways to innovate around sort of moving away from verbal forms of documentation to thinking about non-verbal forms of, of kind of documenting, you know, um, the planning process, which is what, you know, the 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 activists needed help with, uh, with understanding and unpacking and to find ways in which they could represent that through a whole range of non-verbal material, which were sketches, which are diagrams, uh, you know, some of them made sort of little comic strips and graphic novels that, you know, didn't have any words uh, associated with them. And so thinking of different ways in which, uh, you know this this research can be put out also sort of shifting the needle a little bit on what your audience is and what counts as output very honestly um because i feel like what's been very heartening for me to see particularly uh in sort of the way research has been moving is this shift away from only counting academic published articles as the only validated or valorized form of output and i think that again to me is a is a is a really kind of heartening way or direction in which things are moving because the more you valorize different forms of output uh you know that that kind of levels the playing field a little bit as well i i really be fully on there um i don't think we have any other questions so yeah i mean um allow me to thank you again Neha, for kicking out time no, i know it's a of teaching for you so thank you for talking to all of us about this. Um, and thank you to all the attendees also for attending from you know all parts of the world. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks.